Hey, Abe Morgenthaler here. I want to talk about whether or not testosterone helps with erectile dysfunction. Um, it's funny how sometimes simple things get so confused uh, by <laughs> by experts. Um, uh, there is a statement from uh, my colleagues, the American Neurological Association uh, guidelines, uh, that uh, testosterone is uh, should not be used as monotherapy for men with erectile dysfunction. Monotherapy means used alone. Uh, the recommendation is to use it together with medicines called PDE5 inhibitors like Cialis or Sildenafil. Um, Before we start, a small disclaimer. The Sex Doctors podcast is not a substitute for medical or psychological advice. Uh, or just to use those medicines alone, although they do comment uh, that testosterone replacement may help with uh, the efficacy of uh, uh, pills like uh, sildenafil and tadalafil, um, <clears throat> Viagra and Cialis. But I want to get back to this idea about whether or not testosterone works as monotherapy. Does testosterone itself have an effect on erectile function uh, in men who have low levels. And um, to me, this is remarkably simple, <laughs> but <laughs> that's just uh, me. And when I say it's simple, it's because I've treated so many men over 30 plus years. Um, and some of the men come in and um, with ED or and or other sexual issues. And they, if they have low testosterone, we would treat them. And in many of the men, but not by certainly not all, uh, their erections were better and they didn't even need anything like uh, one of the pills to help them. And that's how I like to do it. I like to do one thing at a time if I can. And I usually start with normalizing testosterone. And part of the reason I like doing that is because um, when testosterone is normalized, some men, they feel perfect. They feel back to themselves. And directions may be better, sex drive is better, orgasm is better or easier to achieve, and they're fine. And they go on, and uh, they don't really feel like they've got ED. They feel like they had a hormonal problem that was addressed. Um, there's some data that men who take the PD-5 inhibitors, again, um, brand names Viagra, Cialis, um, that even though those uh, medications may be effective uh, in helping those men with uh, ED, with erectile dysfunction so they can function, those men still feel like they have ED. Um, it's just managed for them. And uh, I can confirm that just from talking to my patients. Um, so thank goodness it's around, but they don't feel like they're cured. They, they just are using the medication to manage an ongoing problem. Uh, compared with men who had testosterone deficiency and their hormones then are normalized and they feel normal. They don't feel like they have ED. They had a deficiency of a hormone that's now been fixed. Now, part of the reason that my uh, colleagues at the AUA, this is the guidelines for erectile dysfunction, um, talk about uh, don't use testosterone as monotherapy is that in not all studies, um, did testosterone work uh, that well by itself? I'm going to talk about why that might be. But the two best studies to look at this and to compare are the um, two out of the three largest randomized control trials of testosterone. The first was called the Testosterone Trials, published in 2016. And they had 790 men aged 65 years and older they excluded anybody with significant cardiovascular disease. And, um, and that study was for 12 months. And um, they looked at various aspects of sexual function and desire, and everything got better in the testosterone group compared to placebo, including erectile function. So Testosterone in the tes testosterone therapy compared to placebo in the testosterone trials improved erectile function. The second study to compare it to um, is the largest testosterone um, randomized control, control trial ever. That's the Traverse trial with main results published in 2023. And that looked at 5,246 men um, younger age, 45 to 80 years old, 
or included a younger age. Um, but these men all had very significant cardiovascular disease. And the origins of this trial were to address concerns about cardiovascular risk with testosterone that had been raised in about 10 years earlier, 2013 and 2014. So this was a trial mandated by the FDA to primarily address uh, this issue, does testosterone therapy increase the risk of heart attack, stroke, and death? And the bottom line after 33 months of follow-up was there was no increased risk. So that was great on the cardiovascular issue. But um, because they had this large trial, the investigators very uh, cleverly uh, decided to investigate other things too around testosterone therapy. And uh, one of them was around sexual function. and. Um, and so uh, when they uh, evaluated these men, sex drive and sexual activity increased with testosterone, again, compared to placebo, but erectile function did not improve, did not improve. And so many of my colleagues and um, uh, concluded, look, largest randomized control trial ever, testosterone therapy did not help with erections. Um, and there it stands for a lot of people. But here's the problem. <laughs> yeah, I laugh because, you know, in order to um, draw appropriate conclusions from papers, you actually have to have a little bit of the context of what they're all about. And importantly, who was it that was the study population? Who were these men? So, and, 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 these men were only in the study, only in the study, if they'd either had a prior heart attack or a stroke, or if they didn't have that, they needed three major risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Things like high blood pressure, history of diabetes, high cholesterol, triglycerides, things like that. Um, one wasn't enough. So this was on the whole, a group that from a cardiovascular point of view were sick. And the reason they were selected for that reason makes sense, which is that the trial was originally designed to look at um, the numbers of heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular death in placebo versus control. And in order to get enough events, like those bad things that happened, you have to have a population that is at risk for those events. So they selected a high risk group. This group by definition was excluded from most other, usually excluded from most other studies, including the testosterone trials. The presence of significant cardiovascular risk was an exclusion criteria uh, for the testosterone trial. So two very different populations. One is no or minimal cardiovascular disease. The other one is must have significant uh, cardiovascular disease. And why this is relevant for erections is this. So a few things are required to have an adequate erection. First of all, the brain has to be turned on. It then has to send the signal from the brain to the penis, that's neurologically through the nerves. Uh, then you need the ability on a vascular level to fill the penis with blood to a good pressure and also to maintain the blood in there so that there's um, the veins don't um, just drain the penis uh, before it should. Um, and that's on the vascular side. And then you need um, the hormones. You need testosterone specifically to sort of prime the brain and to uh, enhance the ability of the uh, mechanisms within the penis to actually um, uh, create the erection. So practically speaking, in most people who haven't had surgery like radical prostatectomy for cancer or who don't have paralysis or no neurologic diseases, when we see men with erectile dysfunction, it's usually either the blood vessels aren't working well enough uh, or it's hormonal. Of course, it can be psychological too, but for the most part, if it's not psychological, it's vascular or hormonal. And it's hard to tell with, a let's say, a 55-year-old guy um, what 
contribution to his ED is coming from the vascular system or from hormonal. And um, sometimes it's hard to tell about the psychological, but that's usually, frankly, easier to tell. If a guy's in a, happy in his marriage um, and happy, interested in sex and uh, not feeling more stressed than usual, not feeling depressed, usually takes, and, and if the features of the ED are that it's been chronic, it's been going on a long time, maybe progressive, getting worse over time, and um, and is there pretty much all the time, rather than sometimes the erection is great, sometimes not. All of that suggests it's probably not a psychological type issue, although there are exceptions. But generally speaking, um, it's not that difficult to tell if men have a physical basis for their ED. So what's the difference between the traverse trial? Why would the traverse trial show no benefit with testosterone for erections and the testosterone trial showed benefit? Well, easy. The men who are in traverse all had vascular disease, substantial vascular disease. And it doesn't matter how great your hormones are or how normal they are. Uh, if you have bad blood vessels, um, you got a strong likelihood of having ED and testosterone is not going to help you if that's the cause. On the other hand, if you take a population of men like in the testosterone trials that don't have a heavy burden of vascular disease and they've got low levels of testosterone, then normalizing their testosterone is going to likely help them with erections. That's what the data show. There's another feature to all this, which I think is also not um, well appreciated by some colleagues, which is that you know having an erection, it, they don't happen. Uh, once you get to 30 and certainly to 40 and beyond, spontaneous full erections don't happen randomly. They might when you're 18 years old, and it might be embarrassingly, or 15, might be embarrassingly so where they happen randomly. But by and large, men need to be in the right circumstance and have to do something or have something done to them to get them excited in order to have a full erection. And the thing that that controls that excitement is is testosterone. So if um, if if a man has low levels of testosterone and his libido, his urge for sex is low, it, it, you need to have a lot of great stimulation to even try and get an erection. Whereas if the testosterone is okay and libido is there, okay, the body's going to respond. In other words, if you don't have great sex drive. It's, it's not easy to get a good erection. And so the effects of testosterone are multifactorial, can happen on multiple levels. There's a beautiful study in uh, rabbits uh, by my colleague and friend Abdul Trash, uh, together with Erwin Goldstein and others uh, from quite a few years ago where they tried to isolate this. And so they took these animals, rabbits, <clears throat> and they... Um, and they're able to measure the pressure within, the, they have a monitor that measures the pressure, excuse me, within the corporate cavernosa, the erectile chambers of the penis. And uh, they can surgically expose the nerves, pelvic nerve that controls erection. When they applied current to the nerve, um, the erection occurs. And they can show this by the increase in the pressure within the erectile chambers. If they castrated the, the male rabbits, um, which means to remove their testicle, which is the primary source of testosterone, they would apply the same current and they got a very weak or absent um, erection. If they gave back testosterone to those castrated males, um, the erection returned when they turned on the, the, the uh, stimulation, nerve stimulation. And, um, and mechanically, when they looked at what happens to the tissues within the penis, is that the castrated animals lost uh, smooth muscle, and it's smooth muscle that's responsible for um, uh, creating the erection. Um, and there were some other changes as well. But if you gave testosterone to those castrated animals, uh, the an anatomy looked normal. Um, the, the tissues looked normal as they had in the in the normal intact uh, male. 
before he'd been castrated. So there are effects at the brain, there are effects on the nerves, there's actually, and, and there are effects within the structures of the penis itself uh, with testosterone. So what does this all mean? Uh, the way that I pract uh, practiced is that if a man came in with erectile dysfunction and low testosterone, um, I would first treat in, with very few exceptions, pretty much all cases, with testosterone first. And I would say, let's see what happens. And the guy would come back in two or three months. Um, and uh, if everything was great, that's all he needed. Sex Usually sex drive improves. Uh, if erections were adequate and fine, he just stays on testosterone. On the other hand, if he came back and he said, um, you know, my erections are no better or they're minimally better, or there's still a lot of room for improvement. At that point, I would add in one of the PD-5 inhibitors, um, uh, daily, daily Cialis, daily Tadalafil is a nice way of doing that. And because uh, a lot of these men still have, and it's because they have some degree of vascular disease um, that, the, uh, that the pills can help with. And of course, if that didn't work adequately, then we had to go on to other things to help with erections. Um, but uh, between testosterone and the, and the oral meds, um, we were successful in a very high percentage of those men. So that's how I did it. You know, every now and again, there was a guy who says, doctor, I'm going away on my like 20th anniversary with my wife next week on a cruise. Uh, it's important that I get to function. And in some of those cases, I'll say, okay, let's give you everything at once or let's try the PD-5 inhibitor now. Um, but anyway, that's the way I practiced and, and the rationale for why I did it that way. So bottom line is testosterone therapy at, as monotherapy can be effective for many men uh, for the treatment of erectile dysfunction, but not all. Um, so that's where we are. That's what I, that's how I practiced. And that's how I see the literature. Thanks.